Here. Councilmember Jeruso. Councilmember King. Councilmember Green. Councilmember Thomas. We have a quorum. Great. Thank you. Can we go ahead and approve the minutes from the May 29th, 2024 meeting? Moved by Councilmember move. Thomas. Seconded by Councilmember King. All in favor? Aye. All right. Great. Um, so today is Monday, June 10th. As we all know, this is the sixth quality of life committee meeting for 2024. Um, and we are going to talk about um, our initiatives around uh, the encampments and homelessness. And so I would invite the speakers up today. Um, we will have uh, Mandy Chapman Sample, uh, Nate Fields, Taylor Dials, and Dr. Vegno. And then I know we also have some folks in the audience who will speak later. You need no introduction, but if you can introduce yourselves. Nate Fields, Director of Home Services and Strategies for the Mayor's Office of New Orleans. I'm Mandy Chapman Semple, Managing Partner, Clutch Consulting. All right. So, uh, one, thank you for having us here today. I uh, just wanted to give some um, updates on some of the work that we have already started and some of the things we're thinking about doing in the future. All right. So, um, we've already presented on quarter one, but here we are um, today presenting on quarter two and three. Um, just wanted to give a couple of things about the initiative, um, some national media coverage, and also uh, securing the remainder funds. So um, we have talked about this before, but really wanted to get into this, the different pathways into housing and what we are trying to do within this initiative and really get people excited about the work that we're trying to do with our partnerships with uh, Unity of Greater New Orleans and also Travelers Aid of Greater New Orleans. Um, Home for Good is our initiative, and in this initiative, we want to let people know that the goal is to um, house and stabilize 1,500 individuals experiencing homelessness using the uh, multiple pathways that we have here listed. Uh, pathway one, targeted encampment decommissioning in the core, and um, we want to know that this is a combination of us, Travelers Aid, and Unity going in day in and day out to do this work. Um, pathways uh, two and three will be that solely of unity, um, coordinated housing, navigation to all other unsheltered persons, and accelerate uh, access to housing from shelter systems. Um, pathway number one, direct to housing encampment work. Um, we have worked, of course, closely with the health department, um, unity, and travelers aid to be able to make pathway one uh, started and you know got some good grounds on pathway one. We wanna keep up on that uh, pathway one and continue the work that we have already done. Here we have the initiative tracker, really looking at uh, the different encampments that we have already taken care of. If you look closely, we have already closed that of Chapatulas, the Treme closure, and um, O.C. Haley encampment closure. Uh, that's where we currently are standing at as we are working on uh, actively sites four, five, and six. Now, and just a reminder, you're not telling people where these sites are and, and tell us why. No. So the safety of the individuals that we're serving, we don't want those individuals to be put in danger of any way, shape, or form. And also for the fact that it makes the work harder when we have people just rusted encampment sites cameras, uh, news persons, anything of that nature that could um, harm the work that we're doing. Um, to date, there are 154 housed persons from the encampments with 97% uh, uh, remained housed within that uh, work that we've already committed to and done. Um, pathways uh, at the bottom two and three, uh, that work is coming soon. We are working on with Unity to get the remaining data that we need to be able to successfully tell the narrative of that story. Um, as you can see here, we have uh, pictures of site number three, O.C. Haley, and uh, this has made it a win for everyone, the persons in the community, the people who were uh, um, unhoused in these locations, the outreach workers who have done all this amazing work, and today we have this area that looks uh, you can see in the pictures, it, we are 
working to clear this area out so folks can have that area back, but also those individuals who are the unhoused are, you know, closing their doors tonight and being able to turn on the AC when it's extra hot outside and get their own waters and be able to take care of themselves. And that's the goal, to continue doing that work, continue having these, you know, great, you know, thought out processes. Um, shout out to, you know, Councilwoman uh, Harris for just supporting us in this process and all of you who have been a part of this process. Um, but just really wanted you guys to see the work is transforming the neighborhoods and those individuals who have housed. Um, Unity did an amazing job uh, talking about, you know, this narrative and really creating a way for persons who were housed to even come out and talk about it. Recently, we've heard that in one of those meetings, the person spoke about being housed, and that's an amazing uh, place where we want to continue to have those individuals come out and say, this is working for us, and this is how you can help. National coverage, um, New Orleans has achieved a 12% uh, reduction in unsheltered population. Uh, we got a statistic from Unity of Greater New Orleans. Uh, we just want to thank them for continuously being a great partner. Thank you to Travelers Aid for being one of those persons who are just boots on the ground day in and day out, making sure those individuals are not only housed but get the things that they need to stay into housing. And in those persons are a day-to-day -day process. They're still working with each one of those individuals, and we are seeing nothing but success and great stories. So nationally, they found out about our wins and wanted to definitely voice that we are doing great work here in New Orleans. And it's a lot of more coverage that's, that's coming. People are calling daily, asking for us to talk about the initiative and the work that we've done. So just want you guys to know we are doing great things here in New Orleans. So next steps, we are really talking about this uh, tracker, um, you know, really getting this tracker on the website with United Way as a host, uh, really putting all of the things that we have done, all the things we're about to do, and soon a tracker will be loaded into the website on the 14th, uh, talking about sites four, five, and six. Um, and each one of these sites and locations will have their, you know, we have to really talk about the narrative and the stories of each one because they're unique in their own. But the last three sites have been these places in the community have been there for quite some time. So we hope with four, five, and six closures, we can really dive into the work that's being done. So we are also looking at some focus groups for the individuals that have been housed. It's one thing to house people, right? It's another thing to hear back from them what things we have done and been good at doing and what things we need to work on. So we hope in these focus groups we can really hear from the individuals who have been housed how this process has worked for them and what things we need to work on differently to make sure and ensure that they are um, happy and safe when they're being uh, going through this process for those first, uh, future individuals going from the encampment into housing. Now we still have some work to do. As of January, uh, Unity has executed the grant from HUD um, and currently working on those resources as we speak. Um, to complete the initiative, we will need to secure $1.3 million in private donations for the Flex Fund um, and $11 million in public and private resources so that we can be able to, you know, keep those persons that we have housed into housing and keep on track with the 515 rehousing packages um, in and by 2025. And these are some of the um, additional resources. And I have with me uh, Mandy, who will dive into these and get you guys a full picture of what we have uh, going on there. So when we put this initiative together, it was imperative that we work directly with Unity to fully leverage all of the existing federal resources and the new federal resources that had been awarded, and then use uh, city resources to help supplement and expand and amplify um, those initiatives that were underway. And that's how the Home for Good uh, initiative came together. And so this is a very simple uh, reflection of um, a, a more complicated slide that we presented to you in October, where it's demonstrating that in order to rehouse 1,500 individuals, we have to have 1,500 rehousing packages. And so through that work with Unity, we were able to identify about 827 packages that Unity already had secured the resources for and were administering. So those were federal and state funds that could be brought to this initiative. 
the city through ARPA funding um, and, uh, and, and other funding added another 158 of those rehousing packages to the mix. And so we launched knowing we had a gap, but also knowing we needed to create a proof point. We needed to prove that this was actually going to work before we could go and ask for additional resources to be invested. And so today, we believe we've, we've demonstrated that progress and we, we desperately wanna keep this work going to finish the job. And what it will take is about 515 additional rehousing packages if we wanna hit the full 1,500 individuals housed by the end of 2025. The flex fund, I think, is pretty straightforward. The city has, has generously uh, identified about $1.5 million in funds to go toward that flex fund, and we've had about 200,000, just over uh, a little over 200,000 from private uh, donors added to that fund, but we need another $1.3 million. Um, and, and there is a timing issue re relative to this 1.3 million that could potentially begin to slow our progress if we aren't able to kind of incrementally get more and more of those private resources in the mix. We have a little bit more time on the 515 uh, rehousing packages, although if we want to accelerate this process, the faster we can get those resources, the faster we can uh, move to more and more encampments. All right. So. Things that have come up during this process, of course, we have to have more funding at the table. Um, and these delays um, make it hard for our partners with Unity of Greater New Orleans to be able to do their work. So we're currently working with them on trying to get them some cash to help them through this process. Um, we ask them to the table. We're get, bringing resources to the table, but we also have to give them upfront cash so they can continue to operate the way they're used to operating. We don't want to slow them down um, with the procurement process, which has been issued and problematic in the past. So with bringing on these funds, we also want to make sure that we are bringing on additional upfront funds so they can be able to be able to do the work that they do without any hitches in the process. Um, and also, we also have some issues with the lack of private investments. We have to do better with the lack of private investments. Um, we have to continue to push that dial in the right direction. It can't be all on one uh, agency. This has to be a citywide effort if we're gonna move it forward. Um, so although we are a part of that you know, work, we also know that we have philanthropic dollars that we have to bring to the table to be able to uh, create a, a sustained you know, issue, I mean, a sustained, uh, way out of this problem that has become problematic to everyone in the city. And the only way to do so is as an entire community. Um, if we put all of this on Unity or Traveler's Aid, then shame on us. We need to make sure that everybody carries their weight within this process, and the only way to do so is together. If we do this collectively, there's no way that we can fall through the cracks. Well, I appreciate your uh, presentation. I have some questions, but I'll turn it over to my colleagues, Council Member Thomas. Uh, first of all, th thank you, Chairman uh, uh, Harris. Uh, you, you talk about homelessness. It's, it's, it's all tied to the same affordable housing uh, issue, the ability to have enough safe, safe sanitary, quality places to live. Uh, one of the things I did was I uh, went to Atlanta to kind of study what, they, what, they, what the, the municipality was doing. Uh, Mayor Dickens there, uh, one of his platforms, the community was that dealing with uh, homeless, dealing with affordable housing, and no matter where you were in the spectrum, you know he said that was one of his agenda and platform items. Invest Atlanta, which is responsible for for the overall economic development of Atlanta, put affordable housing uh, as one of their economic development pillars. So it's not just providing housing; it's also an economic development opportunity. What I found in some in my visit to a couple of the properties with that. The municipality actually used property that they were in charge of or they controlled to deal with the uh, container housing and affordable housing. What is our inventory of property here that the city controls where we don't have to worry about uh, philanthropy or investments? We can say the city has this site where the city can say we can direct affordable housing or housing opportunities for homeless to city-owned property. Where are we in that study or in that investigation? So I would have to do research on it. I have talked about um, certain locations in the past. 
um, that are, you know, fitting to just that. Um, I think there's some other issues that have to work around because of, uh, you know, NIMBY attitudes. But I think for the most part, there are locations where we could do those things. I think that we have to work through those, you know, political pieces, the neighborhoods and getting them on uh, board with us to be able to do those things. I just don't want to get into a fight where we're going back and forth with a community where um, they don't want to see something as that progressive. It can be kind of harsh uh, turnaround, but I do know that it can be done and um, everybody on the city wants to see that happen. I think that the properties that we do have, we can do that work with. I mean, the city has municipal sites that 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 ain't next to nobody. Mm -hmm. But so we haven't done an inventory yet to say the city owns a lot A, block B, C, a building. You know, I know we have properties that we're moving folk out of certain properties to go find more suitable properties. What are we going to do with those buildings or that land? And you're saying we haven't gotten to that point yet to inventory the city's potential opportunities to provide space so we don't have to get into the NIMBYism then because it, cause it's ourism, mm -hmm. right? If you understand my point. Absolutely. I, I, well, like I said, I can't speak to and that. And we don't have to worry about philanthropy investors because we own it. Right. Yeah, I mean, we, we still have to fix the properties up, especially if yeah. they're not uninhabitable, but um, that's still going to be a, a money thing as well. And, and depending on the shape of those facilities, we will have to do something to be able to fix them up for them to be level conditions. However, um, I can not speak to what the inventory looks like. We have an office that deals with that. Mm -hmm. I can get that information over to you as soon as possible, though. All right, two more questions. Uh, when, do we have any survey data from the people uh, who are homeless or the individuals, do we do any outtakes or intakes in terms of the issues and why and where they're from? Do, do we have any of that data com compiled? Uh, yeah, like we have what's called a VI-SPDAT, and some of those issues are labeled within the, uh, the VI-SPDAT. Because one of the things that I have conflict with uh, information is that when I do my own independent surveys, right, versus some of the time the survey, the information the city gets, it doesn't seem to match. Right? So if I walk around corners of certain communities, and when I ask pe many people who are homeless where they're from, 90% of them give me a location that's not New Orleans. Mm -hmm. When I hear y'all give studies, I'm hearing them say about all these people who are from New Orleans that nobody knows from New Orleans. What is the real number? So the, the information that we're giving is combined of the persons who are on the street and those who you don't see on the street because they're in shelter process. Okay. okay. So that's where the numbers may differ at. Um, we okay. have a, a larger group that's in shelter than we do that's on the street homeless. Okay. So we don't have a breakdown that says in shelter versus encampments out on the street. So unity. We don't differentiate that. Unity has given a breaking down. Uh, not too long ago, actually, when they were giving out the pig count numbers of who's on the street and who is in the shelter process. Um, to, have they broken down to where the persons have come from? I'm not sure. Well, I five of the people that I, that I uh, did my own survey with who out in New Orleans East now is only one from New Orleans, and he's, he's, he's got a drug pr problem or addiction, right? That's his issue, but, but he's actually from that community. The other four... Or Alabama, Tennessee, Ohio, and Florida. I mean, those things are very important. Right. I think that the bigger piece is that we're trying to get persons off the street okay. and into housing so that we won't have people dying on our streets right. in, in New Orleans, period. Okay, so then, then the other part of the question to me is that, and first of all, thank you all for the work that you do, mm -hmm. man. It's a blessing. Absolutely. Matthew 25, 35, and 36, right? Uh, when if there, if there are surveys that are done, when asked, why would you choose a city that's not your home, away from your family, away from the people you know, what, what's, the, what's the response? Or do we even ask that question? We have persons who leave from the areas where they come from for different reasons. You have domestics where people are fleeing from domestic issues, persons who have been chased down and, and ran out of town because of gang-related issues. We have people who have uh, been down on their luck and have been sent. Some people who have just traveled and gotten stuck. It's a multitude of different situations that have come up when we're out doing the outreach. Do we ever run into people who... 
the authorities in the other city gave him a ticket and put him on a bus or uh, train to come here? Do, do we ever get that? I mean, I can't say yeah or no to that right now. Does that happen? I'm sure it does. Okay. All right, thank you. Council Member King. Thank you, Council Member Harris. Um, Mr. Fields, I want to start off by thanking you uh, for the work that you've done. Um, always responsive, um, and I've seen the progress, so it's not just talk. I've seen that the camps cleared up, um, especially in the, um, the Clearborn, oh, under the Clearborn overpass in Treme. Uh, the residents, the businesses are, are very ha happy, so thank you for that effort. Um, one main spot that I have is, is Governor Nichols, 400 block of Governor Nichols. Now, I don't know, and I don't know how you all do it. How do you differentiate between someone who is truly homeless and some people who maybe the right word is, is kind of blend in with the, with the unhoused population? Um, and that's really causing the trouble and, and don't want to seek the services that you all are um, providing. Yeah, so um, what Unity has all of the outreach members doing is what's best practice is going out at nighttime to see who's the actual persons living in the encampments mm -hmm. and making sure that those individuals are the ones who are the most vulnerable of that population. We have some persons who come in there who are um, predatory in nature. Um, we watch them as well. We have had uh, on several occasions where outreach workers and city workers who come to clean the areas have been threatened. Um, and those are the individuals that we, you know, we try to work with best as we possibly can. Um, but it's some situations where if they do something that is illegal or does something that to harm somebody else, we have to enact in, you know, the way we have to, which is NOPD. Um, we try to stay away from it as much as possible. And, and year to date, I have one incident that's ever happened that's gotten to that level. Uh, most of the individuals who are in these encampments are the persons that we're trying to serve. Um, Unity, like I said before, and Travelers Aid have uh, created um, the by name list and go by those by name lists. Most of the individuals who meet that list have been out there for at least um, a year. Um, some of the individuals have been persons who've come in, in the last couple of months, but for the most part, the individuals that we have been getting are the persons who have been in those encampments um, according to our by name list process. Well. It's not so much the, so it's not really encampments um, or people that I can tell are, are predators. It's, it looks more like people who just kind of, I, I want to be sensitive, maybe it's had too many drugs in the system. Or, like you can see the empty beer cans. Mm -hmm. I've been sent pictures of the, the needles. So do you, do you take those individuals in? Uh, or are those like the truly unhoused individuals um, or they just kind of, that's what I mean by blending in Absolutely. and don't want the help. Yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot of different resources that we have at play. Um, there's a part in the encampment rehousing process where we have our street medical team who goes out and surveys with the health department underneath the leadership of Dr. Vegno to see the, who those individuals are and what resource would be best for them. So if that's, um, you know, uh, addiction services, mental health services, or anything else. Um, we try to survey those individuals and give them as much uh, resources as we can. Some persons come down there and just hang out with friends because of community. So we have different individuals who come to those encampments for different things. Um, it is um, resource rich areas where people come down and drop off resources and people hang out waiting for food to come. Um, I had a phone call uh, two weeks ago where we had a bunch of individuals who were lined up over by the rebuild and people were worried because they had bags and items in their hands. And um, when I went over there to check in, uh, what we found out was those individuals were waiting for food. Uh, they had bags and items in their hands because they were scared to leave their clothes and stuff at the encampments, but this is the only way they could eat for the day um, as the rebuild is going through uh, construction at the moment. Uh, so it's a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but um, persons come to these encampment locations to give out food, medical attention, mental health services, and they know that if they go to these different locations, they can get the stuff that they need. Uh, we have some persons who are, you know, uh, bad actors who come to these areas and um, some persons who are predators who come to these areas to uh, take on some of those resources as well. Uh, we do a really hard job of uh, sitting there day in, day out sometimes to fi find out who the persons are who actually need the services and who the pretenders are. My last question is, how do you go about identifying the, um, I believe the term is the, the hidden homeless, the, the people who are like on the fringe 
of being homeless or they're not quite there, but then they may be sleeping on a sofa um, or just just almost there. Uh, it, it came to my attention because we, we uh, had some individuals from the Covenant House. And, and after speaking to them, you know, they were, they were homeless, but they weren't in the encampments. You know, they was at relatives' house and ended up in the Covenant House. So how do we identify those individuals before they go to the Covenant House and maybe help take some strain off of places like Covenant House? So what's been happening recently is that we've had, um, even your office has done it. Uh, when we get those phone calls to City Hall, uh, we get those issues. We try to figure out best pass forward for each one of those individuals and every situation is different. Um, more than likely, recently it's been more domestic calls than anything. And we've been able to help some of those domestics by getting out of those situations and into um, a location that's a lot safer than what they're currently experiencing. Um, when it comes to youth and young adults, we have gotten a small percentage, but even for the ones that we have gotten, if there's a way that we can problem solve before the individual actually meets it to the street, we find a way around uh, getting that person the help that they need, um, whether that's a couple of months of rent and security deposit, furniture, food, and even an appointment. Um, in the last three weeks, we've had four persons uh, gainfully employed um, through the work of the DDD and um, Job One. Well, that's all my questions, uh, at least for now, Mr. Fields. So again, um, thank you for the work that you and you've done and that the results are very evident. So just keep it up. Thank you. Council Member Thomas. Yeah, and, uh, and, and again, uh, to Ms. Sample and Mr. Fields, I mean, I think we see some movement now uh, that we hadn't seen in a long time, but, you know, we still have um, a long way to go. Uh, there are some terms in, uh, in, in, in housing, uh, providing housing now, uh, re recovery housing, transitional housing, and it seems like our focus of our conversation is more about housing than recovery housing. And the reason why I ask that question is because, you know, we jump on these trends, right? You know, in, in sick communities, some of the communities we, that we grew up in, mental health was always an issue. Now everybody talking about mental health. They weren't talking mental health when people were pulling guns in our faces. It's 11, 12-year-old kids. Uh, when you're in the second grade, you got to walk by a body for two days in your neighborhood. Nobody asked me if it affected me mentally, right, when the lady stayed on the street two days. But now mental health is the issue and it's trending, just like uh, recycling. And But the old studies that show everybody was trending and chic, all the elites were talking about recycling, and then we found out that 70% of the stuff you recycled wound up back in the landfill. So you paid for recycling. Uh, for a program to admit a re recycling, but it wasn't any real recycling. Recovery housing is different from just housing. What are we doing to provide those type of permanent or holistic services for folk that when we get them housed, there are all those things there to make sure that it's just a transitional house, that it's not a pass-through back to the homeless landfill? Mm -hmm. So... Uh, a couple of things. In the beginning, like I said, uh, when we start to do the surveys and the by name list, we actually come on site with an entire medical team trying to find out what those persons' needs are. Odyssey House has now joined us in the forces of doing so. So if we have a person who's in need of treatment, uh, we offer them treatment in the case management from Odyssey House or from our other unit is following them through their process. And when they're housed, we found out that they're more successful in a housing unit than they would be in a transitional situation. If a person moves several times, they're more than likely to wind up back on the street and there's a wasted resource in that. So instead of us putting the funding into temporary resources, we put them into permanent supportive housing and build all of the services that they need around that. Um, I have several questions, but um, I know we also have some comment cards and we've been here a long time. Uh, but I do want to talk about the difference between uh, outreach on public property versus private property. Um, I know a lot of times we get calls from folks who are like, someone's encamped on a piece of property. We don't know who the owners are. What can y'all do about it? So can you talk about that and, and how you approach people who are on private property versus public property? Absolutely. Um, when it comes to private property, we have to get uh, consent from the landlord to even step on the property to start doing work. 
Uh, once we get into that property, we have to understand that there's laws and stuff in place to be able to protect that individual. So now we've stepped into a, a legality. Um, unless that person has the property secured and, and proper signage, it becomes really problematic. Um, we try to educate the landlord on ways and to be able to uh, keep the individual from living on their property, but we cannot um, honestly do as much as we could do if it was in um, public property. Uh, but we try to do everything we can by offering services, getting them into shelter processes. Um, and Unity has been really good with housing those individuals. Travelers Aid has been doing amazing with the French Quarter um, and managing those areas with persons who've gotten onto blighted or public properties, I mean private properties, and that has been really good and successful. Uh, my team has even been able to help with in the individuals. Uh, just last week, we got two persons connected to shelter services while the um, landowner was fencing off the location. So we've been doing really good in these different areas. Um, I mean, lack of resources makes it a lot harder, but um, when it comes to proper property, um, public property, uh, we have a lot of uh, swaying in that where we couldn't do when it comes to proper property. Yeah, and to Councilmember Thomas's point, I know you and I did a walkthrough um, of Hoffman Triangle, and there were some Nora-owned properties, which is essentially city-owned property, where people were camped out underneath the properties. The property themselves are blighted. Um, so, I, you know, we absolutely... Councilmember Thomas needs to work with our property management folks to identify properties that can be either put back into the system by the city or we have folks here from Habitat from Humanity could be donated so that they can build uh, places on these pieces of city-owned and Nora-owned properties. But we, to your point, we do have a list. It's just a matter of making sure that we're coordinating all services together. Um, I did want to talk about uh, what Council Member King was talking about, which is the bad actors who are in the encampments. I know that Allison from my team has been on uh, walks with you, has been offered drugs. I know that we, I personally and some other staff member can identify drug dealers who are in the encampments. How has NOPD been interacting with y'all to get those bad actors out of the encampments who are really preying on people? Absolutely. So we've been working with a couple of different initiatives, um, one of which is No Dice with uh, the DA's office. And what they have done is instead of uh, going after these individuals within the encampments, they wait till they go outside of the encampments and figure out that this person actually has a house. Mm -hmm. They're coming to the encampments, they're preying on the persons in the encampments and trying to find ways to get those persons out of the encampments. On top of the fact that we have been also working with our folks from LEAD and getting those persons who are um, selling drugs within the encampments, the assistance they actually need. Um, we have worked every way we possibly could to be able to supply uh, support to every individual, even those persons who are the bad actors, saying to them, hey, listen, this is not the route. You can go a different way. And I think word has gotten out because if you go to some of these encampments now, you don't see those persons anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I want to turn to the issue of uh, people who are from New Orleans and not from New Orleans. Council Member Thomas, again, to your point, I have three folks who lived in my neighborhood who ended up under the bridge because of issues like gentrification, uh, issues like property falling, uh, someone dying and not having proper succession. Um, and so I know, Nate, you've worked with, Nate and Unity have worked with um, those folks to get them housed. Um, what can we do to make sure that we're supporting our families who might be in a succession issue. I, I know this might not be your, your expertise, but there are realtors out there. There are lawyers out there who can lend their services to make sure that properties are properly documented, wills are properly in place so that a succession doesn't kick somebody out of a property when their grandma dies, for example. Absolutely. So um, Southeast Legal Services has been our go-to. Uh, Lord Tuggle has been amazing. Um, Lawyers program, they don't have a lot of, you know, persons that they need to do this work, and I want them to have more. Um, hopefully in the future I can build them into the budget because they do amazing work for the individuals that I have sent them. But we need to have more advocates in that, in that area, persons who are talking to families and, and working with families who are in those predicaments. Um, we get those more than we get anything else, and a lot of the persons who have been uh, pushed out of those housing um, and, and forced onto the street just have a lack of resource, not a lack of uh, anything else. They don't have addiction, they don't have mental health issues, but the lack of resources is what drives them onto the street. Yeah. Um, and the situations that you've named, 
every last one of them had a lack of resource. Yep. Um, so when we start talking about who those individuals are, I wish that uh, we had one uh, funding just to be able to catch those individuals before they got into that process and be able to be able to uh, problem solve and get them back into, uh, you know, successful in, into society. But um, in our conversations, what we're realizing, and when I say our conversations, um, Unity, Travelers Aid, and, and my team, is that we need more resources to be able to plug these holes before individuals pour into the streets to begin with. Uh, one of the things that you brought up, uh, Councilman Thomas, was that um, we house these individuals, but we don't give them proper case management and resources. So just last week in the No Dice meeting, I, I charged everybody in that meeting and said, listen, let's stop waiting for uh, us to build a hub out in the east, but let's mobilize and then bring the services to the individuals who need it the most. The community is hurting. Let's make sure that we become a part of that community and bring the resources to that community so that people don't have to go searching for where everything is. Let's not wait till a person becomes homeless before we start putting resources in place to keep them from homelessness. Um, let's get in front of those problems before they become an issue. Um, and I think that that was well received and well heard. Uh, but now we need to start working as a community and stop putting it all on our homeless services centers uh, and be more resentful in this process and thinking about how we could be proactive as everyone who's a part of the city um, to be able to put funds on the table to keep people from falling into this uh, situation to begin with. Uh, Council member, there are uh, legal organizations that do uh, expungement services. Uh, they'll get together at different times of the year uh, to bring lawyers together to help folk with expungements. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could weave, yep. uh, especially successions for homeless families or people who've been kicked out of their pro uh, pro uh, homes because of property disputes, you could weave that into there because many of those attorneys, they use that for continuing education or to get you know, a community service. So maybe that could be a joint thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what I, what I will say to your point, uh, Council Member Thomas, is that Nate, Unity, Travelers Aid, the city, the private sector, the nonprofit sector have really come together on this issue, and that's the only way that we can continue to make progress. So when I point out things like lawyers who might be able to volunteer, as you have, or realtors, and Nate, we've been on some email chains or I've called out some realtors to say, hey, do you want to help us find some housing? for the folks that you're complaining about and they don't take up that offer. Um, but there are realtors out there who would. There are property owners out there who will um, accept vouchers. So I just want to make sure that we are making, being mindful of, of asking for help when we need it. If there's realtor services out there who want to help Unity, for example, identify units, that'd be awesome. Um, Shay's here making that call. You, can add that to your story as well, that we are <laughs> making a call for uh, volunteer realtors, volunteer lawyers who can act absolutely help with this effort. I agree. Um, I do want to want you to talk about Home for Good before I get to comment cards. So can you talk more about Home for Good, what we need, and how we can uh, shine more light on this fund where people can actually take their own money, a dollar a day that they use for coffee, $500, whatever, whatever they have, and donate to Home for Good, which is a flexible fund that allows us to increase our efforts for getting people off the street. So I have a lot of uh, persons who are my advocates and do-gooders in the community who want to do something, and they might not be able to do five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand, but they can do five, ten, twenty dollars. Um, Home for Good is that place where you can go to now to bring those funds to be able to do good things for the individuals that we're trying to serve. Um, we've had persons who like to, you know, see their money at work. Uh, this money will go into the Flex Fund, which will allow us to be able to not only house the individual, but we'll purchase furniture and move-in kits so this person doesn't have to worry about going into an empty place but actually feeling like they're at home. So Home for Good is the initiative of these braided resources that we've pulled to the table that working with Clutch and Mandy have, you know, uh, helped us realize that we need as a community to weave all these resources to actually talk about what things we do have and what things we are missing within that system and be able to pull that together. Right now, 
we are at a place where we need at least 1.3 million to be able to close in on those, uh, you know, moving packages. But Home for Good could live longer than that. Home for Good is for the community. It's for the sustainability of this community, so that when we have that mother and that father who's about to fall into this process, we can possibly help them. That's what this money is supposed to be. And that's what we want to do because, once again, if we lean this entire system on unity of Greater New Orleans and on Travelers Aid to be able to keep people out of homelessness, then that's crazy. We have to be able to make something that's sustainable for this community even after we do the work of getting everybody out of the encampments. And that's where Home for Good is. It's that place where the community can lean on so that we can have more sustainable process and that we can look to in the future to say, hey, we did this. Here's a legacy of this entire group, this entire point in time in the city that we have created to be able to sustain all of the individuals that we've helped. And, you know, for the people who are, you know, there's state legislation now about panhandling and trying to criminalize uh, panhandling. If you don't want to give to a panhandler, you don't want to give to somebody on the street, you can take your dollar, your $5, and go online to homeforgoodneworleans.org. I think that's right. That the website, um, homeforgoodneworleans.org, and donate that money there, and we know that it will get directly into the hands of people who need it. That's right. And we also just want to, once again, like I said, I've said it a couple of times already, shout out to Unity and Travelers Aid. Um, we've had situations that have been dangerous, but Unity still shows up. Travelers Aid has gone into... Uh, situations with us where it has been dangerous, but their people still come on site day in and day out. My team has been joining forces with them. We have been going into uh, situations, uh, rain, sleet, or snow, getting individuals connected to services. And on our winter freeze night, they work with us almost for a 24-hour period, getting those individuals connected to services, and not just to the locations, but we also transported them back to safer locations, uh, sheltering processes, and even housing communities. So I just want to give them a big shout out and thank you for all of the work that they've done to be a part of this process. Yeah, they're great. And I just also want to shout out uh, the Greater New Orleans Foundation and United Way for housing the Home for Good fund. Um, as you're talking about weather events, we are approaching heat waves. I was outside yesterday and it was miserable. I can't imagine being on the street and having to live on the street in this heat right now. Uh, what are the plans to uh, address the weather events that we know are going to come up? So the heat waves that we're going to face, the hurricane season that is predicted to be uh, active. Do we have plans in place for that? Absolutely. We just sat down with NOLA Ready. They're training my team as we speak about uh, different hurricane events, and we're also having conversations ongoing for the remainder of the year about preparations for hurricane season. Um, we're also talking about the heat waves that are coming up, uh, so we're in consistent communications. And the health department actually put out um, some uh, literature recently, and also they have a meter on the page that talks about the different heat uh, color uh, coordinations that they put out. Uh, Meredith did an amazing presentation last week from the health department about what that looks like, and we hoping that we're hoping that uh, with that coordination, we'll be able to be in front of it. We are already stockpiling uh, water and make sure we have uh, uh, cold rags and everything else that we help. Uh, shout out to Aetna for being able, uh, solid partners and helping us prepare for this heat season um, as they did in the cold season as well. All right, if there are no other questions from council members, I'll go ahead and do public comment. We have Marguerite. Followed by Melissa Haley. Thank you. Um, certainly, I, I, you know, I, I commend the city's efforts to address homelessness and increase affordable housing uh, and clutch consulting for your efforts in the Office of Homeless Services and Strategies. Your work is crucial, and we know how hard it is, and I just want to thank you all for that. Um, I'm here, of course, to continue to bring attention to the homeowners who are in distress. Uh, I have over 100 elderly homeowners who are facing imminent foreclosure. Um, and this is not exaggeration. These are people we have worked and worked and delayed and delayed, and we are now faced with having to foreclose on people. And when these foreclosures occur, families who had other means have already taken those steps. These are families who have nowhere else to turn, and we receive those desperate phone calls every week. I don't want to lose my home. Where will I live? What will I do? I'm going to be under the bridge. Um, and 
you know, when these foreclosures happen, it is going to displace vulnerable families and it is going to increase our homeless population. And I know none of us want to see that happen. So we are, of course, seeking assistance to help prevent these foreclosures and keep these families in their homes. And it should be noted, most of these people bought their homes right after Katrina. At the time, Habitat was selling houses to people making 30 to 50 percent AMI. 20 years ago, that wasn't much money, and it's still not much money. Um, but most of them were in hospitality or health care, toiling in low-wage jobs, and they have nowhere else to turn. So I'm asking council to allocate resources and work with this to develop a strategy to save these at-risk homeowners so they do not join uh, the ranks of the homeless and make your job even harder. Thank you. Thank you, and I heard that was a $2 million number, is that? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Melissa, followed by Jessica. Thank you so much, Council um, Person Harris, and thank you for giving the time to, for, to hear about what's going on and the action that's working. I, I have the pleasure of being the chair of Unity's Service Provider and Professional Association, which is comprised of a nonprofit organizations who are extremely passionate about the work and housing people who are unhoused. We understand and we know you understand that nonprofit providers make no money. In fact, we spend money to be able to do this work. This is connected to our mission. And so it's very hard to secure people with the low wages to get out there to do the work, to go under the bridge at night, to stay here doing hurricanes, to really do the work that needs to be done. So I appreciate Unity for their celebration of people who do this work every month. We acknowledge individuals as persons of the month who have done a great job of housing people and have done work in areas with youth, children, and family. We also just had in January where we celebrated persons of the year for doing this work. And it's real important that we continue to celebrate our successes. And I'm glad the media is here because we do not want to continue to be defined by our challenges. Challenges are very real out when we're doing this work. Finding affordable housing. And I appreciate Councilman King for being sensitive about what's going on. If you're sleeping under the bridge, it's very likely you're not doing that sober because you can't sleep under the bridge when you're sober. When you're talking about where people are from, I wasn't born and raised in Louisiana, but I've been here for 40 years and I married a Haley and I love him very much and he works in successions and what they need more when you're dealing with successions is social workers because you deal with a lot of problems with individuals who are in conflict and very scared of a windfall and losing work, so you need social workers to get out there more than lawyers to say, how can we help your family men? And so when you're looking at housing first, the first thing, and I'm an old school social worker, we used to deal with housing ready, where you had to demonstrate you had clear drug tests, that you had to demonstrate that you had all the things with your children. But now we understand, and I didn't believe initially, that when you put a person in housing first, they can begin to deal with mental health issues. They can begin to deal with substance abuse issues. Housing comes first, and then everything else comes after. So I know when you're encountering people, people choose New Orleans because it's a fun place. It's a great place to be. The weather is pretty good. Being homeless in Ohio is not attractive. It is easier to be homeless in New Orleans. And you know what they say, it's not where you're from, it's where you're at. So when they're under the bridge and they're in our community, we treat them just like people of our community. And we know through HMIS where people have been homeless in other places that we work together. But it's real important that we protect the information of the people they serve because if we don't then they will they will not give it to us and we will not be able to find out and be able to support them in a way so I want to thank Nate uh, for coming to New Orleans with his area expertise and working collaboratively with unity and the service providers we are one team we work together and it is all in our best interest to continue to do what's necessary to provide funds to continue to keep people housed thank you very much thank you Thank you for all that you do in the community. Appreciate it. Jessica, followed by Martha. And can I also um, provide, has got an update for um, Donna Paramore uh, from Travelers Aid. Um, she said that she will be uh, having funding, uh, private funding for two outreach workers specifically for New Orleans East. Uh, for, uh, thank you for that information. One of the reasons why it's important to understand where people are and where they come from. You know, people like to tend to want to shine their halos based on how we feel about issues that affect our community. 
I always tell people, people say, well, I, I care 10 percent more than you care. Well, we should all care. And unless this, this country comes up with a housing plan for people to be able to have affordable housing, right? Mm. Veterans, my, my family members who served in, shouldn't have to come back here and not have a place to stay, right? It, it, but they also shouldn't be overburdened to people who love them, or the people whose families they grew up in. So unless we come up with a holistic effort to, to deal with, right? <laughs> so next door in Metairie, they don't have a, a housing initiative or homeless initiative, right? So what does that do to the neighbor next door? Someone asked a question earlier about the issue we were dealing with, right? So if, 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 if you don't fix it here, if there isn't an effort in the community, in the region, in the country, then why is it fair to people, those of us who are doing it the right way, right, where we're using our resources, but we're not getting any extra resources? And so, I mean, I, I hear you. You know, we're in this age now where everyone wants to uh, t uh, try to rate who who give a damn more or who care more. No, we all give a damn. But who gives a damn about us who give a damn, who provide the resources while you're trying to shine your halo to say you give a damn more than the other? And so I would hope we would consider homeowners, business owners, those everyday philanthropists who don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars, but they write their check to the church housing program or to the, or to the feeding program. So we can keep shining our halos if we want, or we can come up with a holistic problem to address it. Because to me, anybody whose zip code is USA ought to have a place to live. Thank you, Councilmember Thomas. Jessica? All right. Hi. Thank you, everybody. And I echo everybody's gratitude for everybody here and all the work that they do. Um, so I want to mention a couple things. I don't know if it's a concern about people getting housing, uh, the acting, but there, and I know Melissa mentioned the HMIS, but there's also an anti-fraud like system people go through for housing. So there is, there are measures in place to make sure people aren't using resources that they should not be, be using. So I wanted to mention that. And I really want to highlight staffing and our case managers because without case managers and adequate staff, which we're talking about federally funded grants that are providing the majority of the money that are housing folks. And the organization I work for, I only get federal funding. So I have to fundraise. And um, Councilmember Harris, you're a wonderful fundraiser. Keep it up. You're, every opportunity you get. And I'm like, learn, I'm like yes. Um, so... But case managers, we don't have enough of them. So I have 50 folks in scattered site housing and for, for three federally funded programs, one of them has a part-time caseworker and the other ones have one caseworker each. So we're talking about, and the clients that are coming into these programs are clients that are chronically homeless defined by HUD. So like Council Member King said, it's not gonna be the people that are hidden on people's couches, but these are the folks we are seeing on the street and we are, we, you visually, like you can visually see I'm in a wheelchair, you can visually see something going on there. And there's a lot that needs to go into that person to help them. So the caseworker is the one, once they go into housing, the caseworker is the one that's gonna help figure out, build the relationship, figure out everything they do, hold their hand into the doctor's office, which God knows how long that takes. And then that's for one person at a time. So how many hours? And so I just wanna highlight that because that's gonna be the next thing we're talking about once we get all this hashed away. And then also um, 100%, let's get a list of city um, owned places that can be revamped and like maybe do it intentionally where we're not talking about giant congregate settings. And then I will say this, I started this grassroots wellness program and it's just at Rebuild. I work at a Rebuild. It's a very comfortable place for the unhoused population to be. To be. Um, we have a team that's been working there a long time. So we're very mindful about how we approach people and to keep the culture as best as we can, like peaceful and caring and holistic and welcoming. And so being intentional, when we're thinking about setting up more congregate type housing settings, let's also build in a plan ahead of time when we're planning it to have access to not just a psychiatrist, 
not just a, a social worker or a counselor, but groups, things that the people need. So maybe like whatever people's council reports on this aspect, thinking about that ahead of time. And um, okay, I think that's, that's Thanks, good for Jessica. now. Thank y'all so much. I really appreciate it, thank you. Martha, followed by Peter. And I also want to just um, give a shout out to Office of Community Development. Um, they helped me with all the contractual agreements and funding that I've been moving around for the last couple of, uh, since I've been here, honestly. Um, also in my office's house. Hello, Martha. Great. Uh, Councilwoman Harris, uh, Councilman King, Councilman Thomas, um, I know you know who Unity is, but for the sake of the public, I'll just say that Unity is the nonprofit lead agency for the um, a collaborative of governmental and nonprofit organizations providing housing and services for people experiencing homelessness in Orleans and Jefferson Parish, and we're called the Continuum of Care. Um, and we would like to express our tremendous gratitude to you for your um, commitment of significant but cost-effective resources um, to reduce homelessness and for your partnership and leadership as we together undertake to bring street homelessness down to very low levels and keep it down. And by working together harmoniously, we can accomplish the most so that the fewest possible people suffer in homelessness. And we all know that New Orleanians are really suffering right now because the rents have skyrocketed so much in the past couple years. Um, you know, we're very concerned about the nearly quarter of our population who are living below the poverty line and the impact of these tremendous rent increases on them. It's also impacting the middle class it's impacting everybody. And it is the major driver of why so many people who were housed last night or last week are suddenly showing up on the street. We and, know and Martha, I don't, I don't want to cut you off, but first of all, thank you for that, right? Uh, because there's this tendency that I mentioned earlier for, for people to want to rate who cares to a degree or who gives, gives a darn the most, right? But I, I think we're forgetting that people are hurting Right. All across the board, right? So that middle class, that working class person right now, them, their margins ain't tight. They're underwater. Right, right. They, 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 you know, they, they, that young person who thought this, they start a home, right? Insurance costs, you know, flood insurance. They, they, they're that senior citizen. But many senior citizens now who people would, would call NIMBYs or people who would call certain groups, guess what? They're being pushed out of their properties. And, and so I'm, I'm glad you said that because sometimes we tend to, based in certain industries, so especially with the social science, we tend to want to categorize. And then, and then the politicians ain't doing number line anyway because it ain't fixed. So, peop so people will play to you, tell you what you want to hear, right? You, you, you tickle your back, and we still don't have funds or money to do the program. So we have to come to a point where we're not talking about this group who's hurting versus this group who's hurting, but how can we do something holistic so that nobody's hurt? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's one thing that's there. important, I appreciate your saying that, and I think one thing that's important for the public to realize is that um, housing, unfortunately, in our country, even for the poorest people, even for elderly people, even for people with severe disabilities, is not a right, and only about a quarter of all the people who are financially eligible for housing choice vouchers, what we commonly call Section 8, actually get them, actually get any housing assistance whatsoever. So that's really, you know, the problem is that we, we, we simply don't have the resources and so many people are suffering. And I really deeply appreciate the fact that the city, the administration, Nate, y'all, the council, uh, Leslie, your leadership has really appreciated our, you know, working hard to, um, you know, try to make a difference. And, you know, by working together, I think we can really make a huge difference in this. Um, as Melissa Haley alluded to, and Jessica Lavelle alluded to, you know, the whole collaborative in the continuum of care is already housing on any given day over 3,500 vulnerable people who were rescued from homelessness weeks ago, months ago, years ago, even decades ago. 
and Jessica was describing just some of the very heroic things that relatively low paid people in our city are doing every day just to keep people stably housed and we have a very high percent, percentage rate of keeping them housed, like 95% of our people stay housed. But we need to do something about the 1,454 people that we just counted who are literally homeless in our January point in time count. If it weren't for the work already being done, we'd have 5,000 people on the street, but that 1,500 people who are still on the street are way too many. We're making a lot of progress. The city deserves a lot of credit for that. And one of the things I really want to give a shout out to is that for the first time ever, um, and, and Clutch, Mandy, all credit to you for this. You know, we really, and Leslie, for your leadership on this as well, you know, you're putting together a sustainability plan so that you're recognizing that even the wonderful federal grant that we got that has enough resources to house 420 people off the street is not enough um, because there are new people becoming homeless every day because of this crisis and you're putting together a sustainability plan so that we can try to keep the numbers down, get them down, keep them down. Um, we really appreciate your recognizing as well that there need to be permanent housing resources for the people in shelter as well. And I just have to say my thanks for all the people who are toiling in the vineyard so hard on this work every day, particularly the case managers at all of our agencies, Volunteers of America, Odyssey House, START, Traveler's Aid, NAMI, DePaul USA, Easter Seals, Catholic Charities, Covenant House, Responsibility House, Metropolitan Human Services District, Jefferson Parish Human Services Authority. I can't name them all, but those are just some of the many organizations doing this really wonderful work. It takes a village. We're going to get it done. I thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you, Martha. Thank you for all of your work and years and years of dedication for this. Um, Peter, followed by Kim, and then we will wrap it up. Do we have any public comment? Okay, great. Hi, Peter. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. My name is Peter Waring. I live at 2619 Fern Street. Uh, I'm in my second decade of volunteering with Unity. I've served on their board of directors uh, for many years. I've watched very closely their activities. And I think there's a lot of good news to report. Um, I'm seeing major thrusts forward in, in attacking the issue of homelessness. Um, and I think that there's a lot of really good news. So I want to spread that good news. Um, first of all, 734 people experiencing homelessness were newly permanently housed from uh, September of 23 to May 31st, this immediate past May 31st. 312 people moved off the street, includes 67 people housed with the new HUD unsheltered grant. 157 of the 312 people were living in encampments. 155 of the 312 people were living in other street locations. 113 people moved out of homeless shelters. 101 people in families moved off the streets or out of homeless shelters. 68 veterans moved off the streets or out of homeless shelters. And when we say moved out of homeless shelters, we mean moved into permanent housing. 132 survivors of violence were moved off the streets or out of homeless shelters. 17 youth were moved off the streets and out of homeless shelters. I want to thank you very much, all of you, for your support in reducing street homelessness. This is to provide you with a report, basically, of Unity's overall work, as well as our specific work with our new HUD Unsheltered Homelessness Grant. Between September 1st, uh, 2023, and May 31st, 2024, the, United, the Unity Continuum of Care, which covers New Orleans, Jefferson Parish, and City of Kenner, has newly permanently housed a total of 730, 743 people ending their homelessness by finding them apartments, providing rent assistance, and ongoing case management services provided in the home. This achievement is in addition to our caseload of about 3,500 people for whom we are continuing to provide permanent housing and case management services so that they do not relapse into homelessness once again. The attached chart, of course, and I'll, I'll be glad to share that with you guys, breaks down who has been housed and the types of homelessness situations from which they were housed. And that's, that's the information I basically read to you a couple of seconds ago. We used a variety of resources, many with different requirements, 
in order to accomplish this. We are tracking progress since September 23 because that's when Unity launched its State of Louisiana Rapid Rehousing Program to jumpstart the HUD Unsheltered Homelessness Grant while we awaited a signed contract from HUD and began working closely with the City of New Orleans on a place-based strategy, focusing on housing persons living in encampments dangerous to health. Now, as of May 31st, 2024, the new HUD Unsheltered Homelessness Grant has permanently housed a total of 67 people, or 16% of the total of 420 people who will be housed by this grant. The 67 people are included in the chart that I just read. Uh, in addition to the 67 people housed by Unity's new HUD Unsheltered Grant, as of May 31st, 61 other clients were being assisted by our subcontractor agencies, the Continuum of Care, to find housing. Of the 67 housed, 62 have been housed in permanent supportive housing programs, which require as a HUD condition of eligibility, detailed documentation of disability and their need for ongoing supportive services. The other five persons have been housed in a HUD unsheltered homelessness rapid rehousing program, which does not have a requirement for documentation of disability. Now, I am the immediate Vice President of Unity. I've been part of Unity, as I said, for the for more than, well, I'm in my second decade of working with them as a volunteer. You know, you paid your dues a long time ago. I'm sorry? You paid your dues a long time ago. There you go. Thank you. Um, it's very important that we continue to work together because by working together, we can get this done. I'm not really happy with the fact that under threats to progress in the handout today, the opening bold statement was Unity's delay in executing the ARPA contract means we cannot proceed with the next encampment. That's actually pretty much a serious misrepresentation. We don't appreciate being characterized as delaying this process. This is not true. The city's request for information was only tendered this past Friday afternoon. Our attorneys have to look at it. And uh, we don't see how this can be an effective team uh, with the board observing this kind of information or misinformation being distributed. It's important that the community know that we're working together and that this represents an important breakthrough in the way municipalities address the issues of homelessness. And New Orleans got this grant because unity does it better than anyone. Thanks, Peter. And, and we understand the procurement issues acutely, acutely. So I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Kim, Alexander, and then we will end with Joe. Hello, everyone. I had no idea that I would be speaking today. I am a Unity resident. Unity has helped me change. Unity has helped me change my life. New Orleans, I love this city more than I love my own hometown. New Orleans has made me an artist. I finally got my artist license and I plan on paying Unity back one day, however I need to pay them back, whether it be volunteer, whether it be service to someone else, teaching them and showing them what needs to be done to continue to stay housed. Hopefully I can do that one day. In the meantime and between time, there's only one complaint I would have, and that is once someone is housed, they must be catered to, consulted, checked on, praised, all those things have to happen in order for someone to stay housed because that's how I'm able to be five years later trying to get myself together to where I can cut unity loose and let someone else have that voucher. But the only thing that, the only complaint I have is that right now I haven't spoken to a caseworker in two years. Why? Why haven't I? Only reason I'm not only reason I'm able to stand up here and communicate with you properly is because I've taken it upon myself to be successful. 
Some people can't do that. They need support. They need a pat on the back. They need someone just to call and say, hey, are you okay today? Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Ms. Kim. And I see Jessica shaking her head. You're absolutely right. Um, Joe? Good afternoon, council members. I know you are all well aware that um, of Unity's programs, um, but I would like the public to also know that, that one way that they can contribute and, and be a part of this important work that ad addresses the needs of very many people is by um, uh, donating to the, uh, our programs that will help folks with the, the move-in kits, and the essential furniture supplies that they need, because not only are, are we working to house folks from encampments in the urban core, but we're housing folks from domestic violence shelters, family shelters, from uh, places all around the city and uh, throughout Orleans and Jefferson parishes. So if people would be interested in donating household goods or furniture, supplies, we would be very grateful for that type of support and can put that to good use in, in making sure that people's home um, is a wonderful, secure, and enjoyable place to be. They can, people who wanting to do that can contact us at, uh, 483-9300 or uh, on the Unity website, reach out to the Unity Warehouse. Thank you, and thank you for all your work. Any last comments from our presenters? No. Okay, well, let me just give a plug to the Housing Trust Fund. Uh, this council has created a housing trust fund, but there will be an amendment, a charter amendment in November where people can vote to have 2% of the city's budget, not new taxes, but 2% of the city's budget, go into a housing trust fund that will support the creation of affordable housing, uh, will support things like fortified roofs, will support things like elderly people being able to stay in their homes, people who are habitat, household owners being able to stay in their home. So um, we'll need to plug that as a council. I'm very excited about it, but the housing trust fund will be on the ballot in November and tell all your friends, cousins, family members, aunties, uncles, tell them to vote for it. Thank you. And with that, I'll move to adjourn. Second by council member King, all in favor? Aye, thanks. <laughs>